Hi, I'm David. This video is a supplement to my last video, Web Programming Part 1, which introduces HTML and CSS. In this video, I'm going to walk through the steps to create this bare bones but not unattractive website. To start, I'll put in a header element. This won't affect the styling, but it's a good semantic tag to know. Inside the header, I'll put the heading, the top level heading in this case. That's a good start, but I want this heading to be centered. When we look at this element in the inspector, we can see that as a default block element, it takes up the entire available horizontal space. And this is fine, but I want the text to be centered. So I can apply the text align property to the H1 element. Next, I'll put in the HTML to render the nav, the navigation element, and the main content area. Main and article are also useful semantic elements to know. For now, I'm just going to put the headline that goes inside the article. I use the H2 element because I want this heading to be smaller than my main heading. Right now, nav and main are default block elements. So they're just behaving normally, taking up the entire width available and breaking things up onto separate lines. What I want to do now is put both of them on the same line. To do this, I'm going to change the display property on both of them at the same time from the default to inline block. Notice that the two words are aligned vertically at their baseline. Again, we can use the inspector to see a little more precisely where these elements are and how they're laid out. Now, just to make them a little bit easier to see, I'm going to give each element its own background color, and then I'm going to set the widths of each one to make it take up most of the available space. Now we're getting closer, but really I want these two elements to take up the entire space available. So if I set the first one, the nav element, to a width of 30, and the main element to a width of 70%, then theoretically those two should add up to 100% and the two elements should exactly stretch the available space. However, you can see that something is going wrong here. And it's actually not so much a CSS problem as it is a problem with our HTML. When, whenever there's white space in the HTML, however much white space there is, it's reduced essentially to a single space. And you can see it a minute ago <clears throat> when the two divs are laid out side by side, you can see that there's a tiny little space between them. That's just like if somebody had pressed the space bar. We need to get rid of that space if we want to be able to have the two elements span the entire width as we want. So to do that, we could take out the space. But since I like to have a little bit of white space in my HTML code, I'm going to use an HTML comment to get that white space back in there. But by making this whole white space in a comment, it will not be um, parsed as white space. So that's what an HTML comment looks like. And they can be on just one line, but as you can see here, I've stretched this one over several lines and it works just fine. Looks like, kind of like a tag, it has an exclamation mark at the front of it followed by two dashes, and ends with two dashes. And other than that, it's encased in the same kind of angular brackets that tags are. But now, what if I wanted to add a border and padding to these? Well, let's see what that looks like. Don't quite want it that thick. Here I'm using a unit called M, E-M. And this is essentially related to the current font size. It is the current font size. And the benefit of using this, which is called a relative unit, is that 
if I, as the user, were to change the size of the base font on this page, it will affect the size of my border and padding here, for example. And just to show you what that might look like, I'll go ahead and increase and then reset to default the size of uh, text on this page. As the font size increases, this increases proportionally. But as we can see, by adding this border and padding, now the two elements are no longer on the same line. We can get them back on the same line by changing the box sizing property for both of them. Setting the box sizing property to border box means that when we specify widths, for example, 30% for the navigation element, that 30% now will apply to the width of the element if you include the border and the padding. Whereas if the box sizing property is left to its default, then the 30% only applies to that content area, and that will be made 30%, and the padding and border and margin are all outside that 30%. If you change box sizing to border box, then only the margin is outside what the specified width or height of the element would be. As you can see right now, as much as we've changed these two elements, the text is still lined up on its baseline. But what we really want is we want the navigation element to basically be up at the top. Um, we want its top border to be level with the top border of the main element. And we can do this by setting the vertical alignment on either element to top. So I'm going to do it on the main element. Vertical alignment is a little subtle and doesn't come up very often, but it does come up when you're working with inline or inline block elements like we are here. If you want to get into this a little bit more, or any other subject, I highly recommend the Mozilla Developer Network documentation. So for example, if I wanted to search up this particular topic, I would search for MDN and then some kind of keyword. So in this case, maybe, maybe vertical alignment. The MDN documentation often has examples and sometimes they're interactive. So right here, they provide a nice interactive example that shows some of the different um, behaviors of the different possible values for vertical align. Now, this uh, could be a little bit better if they just showed the border of this element. So I'm going to do that using the developer console. Now, when we select top, for example, we see that the star has moved up to be level with the top of the element. Now, I'd like to add some dummy text to my main content area. And People in the printing business have been doing this for hundreds of years, and a long time ago, somebody came up with a text, a bit of Latin text that he pulled or assembled out of some uh, books that he had on hand, and it's now referred to as lorem ipsum, and if you just search up the term, you'll find a number of different sites that will give you lorem ipsum text that you can use. This page has some history where it comes from, what the source material for it is, what the standard passage is. I'm going to paste that in here, and I'm going to break it up into two paragraphs. Now the next thing I'd like to do is style the nav bar a little more and maybe fill out the links. For the various navigation links, I'm going to use an unordered list. Now I don't particularly want those bullets to show up. Basically, I need to look up what the CSS properties involved are. I could either go to the MDN documentation, which is a good way to go, or in this case, I think I'm just going to use the developer console to look at what CSS is being applied by the default style sheet. 
you can see down here that it has under UL for the unordered list element, it has the property list style type set to disk. So let's see what happens if we reset it to none. Ah, I applied it to the wrong element. I have the particular list element selected, but I actually want to go and edit the styling for this entire list. There's one other thing I would like to get rid of, which is this padding or margin or something that's pushing the text over to the right. And by using this little tool down here, I can see that the particular part that's bugging me is this right here. And so it's padding. And by looking through the list of uh, user agent style sheet properties, the bottom one says padding inline start 40 px pixels. So that's what's causing that indentation. And I'm just going to reset that value to zero to get rid of that. That looks nice. I like that a lot better. Now that I have those two things pretty much set up in the developer console, I'm going to copy and paste into my document. Ah, but where am I going to paste it? I need to create a new rule set. This one for unordered lists. Even though list style type really applies to the list items which are inside this, many CSS properties get inherited. And that's what's happening in this case. Now, I'd like to change the color and the border and the margin of the nav element. And that will do a couple of interesting effects. Background color to set the background color. The color property sets the text color. The border radius property allows you to round the corners of your element. Now you can see that right now all four corners are getting rounded and that's not actually what I want. Lots of CSS properties are shorthand properties that actually set or can set multiple values at once. In this case, we can set the border radius for each of the four corners. We can do it with this shorthand by specifying four values. So as we can see from the Indian documentation here, the shorthand property sets these in the order border top left border top right, border bottom right, and border bottom left. In other words, starting from the upper left hand corner and going clockwise. So for us, we want the first one to be rounded, the next two not to be rounded, and the final one to be rounded again. Now, I would like this navigation bar to be offset just slightly from the top. So to do this, I can simply add some margin but in this case, I only want to add margin to the top. Now let's take a minute to add links to the navigation bar and work on styling them. So first of all, to make these into links, I'll use an anchor element with an href attribute. As you can see, by turning these into links, their styling has been altered drastically. Now they're displayed in a dark blue with an underlining, but if you click on it, it will turn red. To add styling for links, it's very common to set these for four different states. There's the default styling of the link. Unset will return the value from the special link styling to what it would have been otherwise, in this case, inheriting from its parent, the navbar. Next, we can specify special properties for if the link has been already visited. By specifying the hover pseudo selector and setting the text decoration property, we can put the underlining to the link only when the mouse is over it. And finally, we can specify styling if the link is being clicked.
These days, many colors are built into CSS, and it's easy to find a list. Now let's add the footer to the document. Like with the header, we'll first use a semantic footer element, and within it we'll just have some simple text. Many special characters aren't allowed in HTML documents, and so to use them, you have to look up the HTML entity. Now I'd like to use CSS to again make the background black and the text color white. Like with the heading, I'd like to make this centered. As with the navbar, I'd also like to add a little bit of white space above this, which I can do with the margin top property. And a little bit of padding. Notice, however, that this doesn't actually span the entire width of the page. For some reason, there's a little white space on the left and right. Let's see if we can find out why with the developer tools. It turns out that the body has a margin around it that acts like padding. If we set this to zero, we'll be able to span the entire width of the page. We can modify the body style using CSS. And while I like that for the footer, now my main content and navigation bar are stretched too far. Really all I need to do is shrink their widths a little bit and, especially on the nav bar, add a little bit of margin on the left. I can likewise shrink the width of the main area slightly. Ah, but the margin left here should have been 5% so that we have things nicely centered. Now to be really precise and proper or excessively anal, I could put a little bit of margin on the right hand side of the main element. And now if we look in the inspector, we'll be able to see that this element spans all the way to the right margin of the page, just like this one starts at the left margin. Now the only quibble I have now is that I would like the whole text of the document to be a little bit bigger. So I'm going to set the body font size to be larger and it will be inherited by all of its subsequent children.